Dragon Quest XI is pretty good, isn't it? That's quite good, quite good. I'm fairly fond of the Dragon Quest games, and this is more Dragon Quest, so there's nothing really to be surprised by, but there's nothing to dislike either if you like the Dragon Quest games. It's not like they come out every single year, so more of the same is quite welcome in that regard. Dragon Quest XI Echoes of an Elusive Age is about the Luminary, a fabled hero who's going to save the world from the Lord of Shadows, except he ends up wanted as a fugitive by the Kingdom of Heliodor, who've come to believe that the Luminary is actually the Darkspawn, whose existence is so tied to the aforementioned Lord O'Shadows that he needs to be locked up so that we don't see the bad guy anymore. Something tells me they're wrong and all sorts of hijinks will ensue. As if you couldn't tell already, it's not the most original premise in the world, especially with names like the Darkspawn or the Dark One or the Lord of Shadows, but it's solid enough if well-trodden ground to build your game off of. And it's presented with that typical charm and humour that we come to expect in a Dragon Quest game. Our ever-expanding party of heroes are saving the world from the Dark One, yes, but it's not an adventure that gets maudlin or depressing. I will say, though, that maybe it's time for the protagonist of Dragon Quest games to have a voice to actually speak. It's especially noticeable here when you get far enough into the game to have the protagonist quite emotionally involved in the plot. This is a personal story for them, and yet they don't speak. And this isn't helped by the fact that the cast of characters that join the party aren't particularly interesting. Most of them are fairly straight-laced without a burgeoning personality to speak of, except for the one kid who's just a typical brat. But they are balanced out by the one party member with an overwhelmingly wonderful persona, Silvando. He's gloriously camper than Christmas, a total scenery chewer, and if there's a spotlight anywhere, he'll commandeer it. A total highlight of the game, this guy. If you have played a Dragon Quest game, you'll have a fairly good idea of how this one plays out. You travel from town to town, across a map dotted with monsters that you can engage with at will, and tackle in straightforward turn-based combat affairs. The monsters you take on are cartoony and humorous, often with names that are truly awful puns, in a good way. Your party members have a small variety of weapons they can specialise in, as well as their own unique abilities, and some common spells that almost all the characters have, like healing or fire spells, etc. You can choose which members of the party you control in battle, and any you don't control you can give a series of commands and they'll obey those, such as focusing on healing, or being aggressive, or striking a balance between offense and defense. You can even set the player character automatically if you want. Personally, I prefer to control the player character and let the other three members of the party do their own thing, because they'll make decisions quicker than me and I'll just sit there staring at the menu for too long. But you can control every single one if you want, the game's fairly flexible in that regard. Compared to Dragon Quest VIII, which is the Dragon Quest I spent the most amount of time with, Dragon Quest XI seems a little on the easier side, so if you like a challenge you might want to pick the draconian rules at the start of the game where you can impose several limitations on your characters. They're fairly harsh, but if you like a challenge that's the best way to get it here. When a character levels up they get obligatory stat boosts and also skill points that can be invested in a tree along several branching paths. These skills get expensive fairly quickly to the point where the skill points are so drip fed to you I wonder why they didn't just unlock the skills naturally for you as you progress But in any case I would recommend you have a look at these skill trees Have a look at the directions they're taken in and map out where you want to go ahead of time Look at the abilities you want to unlock look at the perks that you want to have on your character and head straight there Without being distracted by any other skills or abilities you might be able to unlock along the way quibbles aside though Dragon Quest 11 is just pleasant. It's a simply pleasant game. It's somewhat relaxing to head out into the world and bash up monsters, or exploring the towns to find new items or crafting recipes. Crafting itself is a great little system where you throw the ingredients into your fun-sized forge and hammer out the materials filling up several meters in an attempt to smash your way ever so carefully towards the sweet spot and hopefully come out with a plus one, plus two, or even plus three item. I'm pretty much 
sick of crafting in video games, but the crafting system here is just a fun little mini game. And making a perfect piece of gear is accompanied by a fanfare and is just incredibly satisfying to pull off. Dragon Quest XI is a gorgeous game, that has to be said. It's colourful, it's vibrant, it's lively. On an Ultra HD TV, it really pops out. I don't know why the game industry insists on being so bleak and drab half the time. Those games can look gorgeous, but few of them actually stand out in an HD environment. They never did. The soundtrack, composed as ever by a war crime denier who thinks The Rape of Nanking never happened, isn't all that memorable. Usually it is. I can remember the battle theme from Dragon Quest VIII even now. And that game came out in 2006 in Europe. But here, I can't remember it at all off the top of my head. I do remember which war crimes have happened, though, which does put me above Dragon Quest's composer. The character models are great, but they do take a little getting used to, since they're a bit fleshier than in something like Dragon Quest VIII, which was a lot more cartoony. And they got their Dragon Ball Z style still, especially in the eyes. So they're a lot fleshier. They're like these fleshly beasts with Dragon Ball eyes. And the first time I saw it, I recoiled in horror, but I'm very used to it now, and they do look lovely. You just, as I say, gotta get used to them. If you couldn't tell already, I put Dragon Quest VIII on a bit of a pedestal, which might have tempered my reaction to this game somewhat. But it is, as I said at the top of the video, a very good game. It's a good game. It's not blowing my mind, but I am enjoying it. I'm playing through it. I'm having a laugh. It's a laid-back, fun adventure with a silly sense of humour and Silvando. It's got Silvando in it. I can't say that enough. It's got Silvando in it. He calls you darling. I love flamboyant camp stuff because in more ways than one, I'm a massive gay. Anyway, if there's one thing Dragon Quest XI needs more of, it's monsters that you can mount. Not in that way. Sometimes you can ride them. Not in that way around the world. You can jump on a Hornite. It's like a Hornet and a Knight mixed together. It's just one of the many great names you have for monsters in this game. You can jump on that and fly around. Or you can jump on a six-legged skeleton that will crawl and skitter across the floor at a nice clip. I imagine they'd be game breakers if you could ride them the whole time. But I would love more of them because they're really fun to ride around on. You do get a horse for the main open map though. And you can bash into monsters and send them flying. And it's never not enjoyable. And that's your Dragon Quest XI. An enjoyable game.